Hello everybody. Welcome again to Storytime from the Milledgeville Public Library of Illinois. The story we have for you today comes from a collection known as the 1001 Nights or the Arabian Nights. So it's a story that comes from somewhere over in the Middle East. And it's the story about a poor tailor's son and how he became the sultan of an entire city. This is the story of Aladdin and the Wonderful Lamp. Many, many years ago, there was a poor tailor. He sewed clothing from one end of the day to the next, but he never seemed to make a whole lot of money. And unfortunately, when you don't have a whole lot of money and you get sick, it's very hard to get medicine or to get a doctor. And so the poor tailor died. He had a wife and a young son when he died, and his wife did her best to keep enough food on the table for her son to grow up and to not be too hungry all of the time. But all she could really do was spin thread and it didn't earn very much money. And so although they never starved, they were always rather hungry. Well, one day the young son, whose name was Aladdin, he had grown up into quite a very nice looking young man. And he was kind to the people around him, even though he didn't have much. He helped and shared what he had with the people that had less than he did. And one day he was in the marketplace talking with some of his friends when a man walked up to him. Now this man, he looked a little old, but it was rather hard to be sure for this man had a big black cloak wrapped around him and pulled up over his head. And all they could really see under the cloak of the hood of the cloak were his eyes glittering out of the darkness. What they could see, however, were hands wrinkled a little bit and black, darker than any skin they'd ever seen before, but with beautiful rings glittering on them. Well, this man walked up right up to Aladdin and he said, I have come from Africa to find my brother and I find that Allah has played a trick on me for he has died. But they tell me that you are his son. And so I would like to help you. We are both of us going to be rich. Come with me, nephew, and I will help us both be rich. Well, Aladdin was a little skeptical. For you see, he did not think his father had any brothers. But he wasn't exactly sure. His father had been, I mean, he had been quite young when his father had died. So perhaps his father had had a brother that he just hadn't told Aladdin about. Aladdin wasn't really sure. Should I go with this man or not? But then the man reached into a pouch at his side and he brought out a gold coin. That was enough money to, to feed him and his mother for a week. And then he took a ring from off his finger and he gave it to Aladdin and he said, here, this is for you, for you are my brother's son. And now will you come with me and I will make us both rich. Well, Aladdin thought that perhaps this would be a good idea now. He had a beautiful ring and nobody would give a ring to just any old poor tailor's son in the streets. And the man had also given him enough food for a week in one gold coin. So he must be a good man. And he was probably was his father's brother. And so he went with the old man out of the city. Now the old man was not Aladdin's uncle. In fact, he was an evil sorcerer who was using Aladdin to get something that he wanted. Together, the sorcerer and Aladdin went out of the city and up to a huge mountain. And once they were there, the sorcerer said, here, here is where we will make our fortune. Go and gather some firewood. And so Aladdin went out and pretty quickly, he had a pretty good sized bundle of firewood and he brought it back and he laid the fire and he lit the fire. He was a little puzzled as to why this old man would want a fire 
on such a very warm day as this was. But sometimes old people got cold when no one else was, and so he lit the fire. Well, once the fire was burning well, the old man reached into another pouch at his belt, and he brought out a little bag, and he sprinkled some powder over the fire. <sighs> Whoosh! The fire went up in the air and disappeared. And suddenly there was a giant pit in the ground in front of them. Whoa! Uncle, you are a magician, said Aladdin. I have a little magic, said the man. Now, do you see that door down there, that big plate of metal down there with the handle on it and the ground? Yes, said Aladdin. Go down there and open it. I don't think I want to. That's a very big hole. What if I hurt myself climbing down there? And that door looks very, very heavy. I do not think I want to go down there, Uncle. But the old man began to look rather angry. And Aladdin was not sure that the old man was not going to hit him. And so he turned and scrambled down into the hole. When he got down into the pit, he walked up to the big metal door and he grabbed a hold of the ring and he pulled. He expected it to be rather hard to pull. But to his surprise, the door came open quite easily. He pulled it open. He said, all right, uncle, I have the door open. Now what do I do? Go through that door and you will find a big cavern filled with many, many pots of gold. Oh, should I bring you the gold? No. No, do not bring me the gold. Go through the gold cavern. And when you get to the other side, there will be another cavern, and this one will be filled with a beautiful orchard. Go through the orchard, and at the back of the orchard there will be a wall, and on that wall is an old brass lamp. I need you to bring me that lamp. That lamp is what I want. All right, said Aladdin. Thought it was a bit odd that his uncle did not want the gold but wanted an old brass lamp but if his uncle said it would make their fortune then he would go and do it and so in he walked through the door sure enough the very first cavern was a big room filled with great big tall jars of gold it was all shining so beautifully aladdin was very tempted to take some but he did not have any pockets on his pants, and so he had nowhere to carry gold. It would just slip through his fingers. And besides, he needed to find that lamp. His uncle was getting a little bit scary, and he did not want him to get angry. And so he walked through the room of gold and into the next room, and there he found the orchard. But his uncle had not told him how beautiful it was. Every single tree was heavy laden with fruit, and such fruit! It shone and sparkled with brilliant colors. Oh my goodness, it looked delicious, but Aladdin knew he had to get that lamp. And so he went through the orchard, and at the back of the orchard he found the wall, and on top of the wall, a very old, rather battered-looking brass lamp. Well, he picked it up and he looked at it. He didn't see anything special about it. It just looked like an old lamp to him. But it was what his uncle wanted. And so he took the lamp and for safekeeping, he stuck it inside his shirt. Then he turned around to leave. But as he went through the orchard again, the fruit was glittering at him so temptingly, he decided he would just take a pear from off of one of the trees. And so he walked up to the tree and he plucked off the pear. But he found to his surprise that it was not fruit at all. It was not food. It was cold and it was hard like glass. And it glittered so strangely. But it was very pretty. And he knew some of his friends would very much like to see these very pretty fruits and they might like to have one for themselves. And so he picked many more fruits off the trees and stuck them inside his shirt for safekeeping on top of the lamp. 
Then Aladdin left the chamber with the orchard, and he went through the chamber with the gold, wishing all the way that he could pick up just one or two more pieces so that he and his mother would have enough food for a couple of weeks, not just one week. And then he came to the door, and he came out of the door, but he was still in the pit, and he did not know how he was going to climb out. It had been hard enough sliding down. The old sorcerer looked down at him and said, Have you the lamp? Hand it to me. He said, Well, I can't, uncle. I have to take all the fruits out of my shirt first. Help me climb up, and then I can get the lamp for you. No, no, said the old sorcerer. Give me the lamp. For he was sure that Aladdin was lying to him and trying to keep the lamp for himself, because that's what the sorcerer would have done. But I can't get to the lamp, uncle. It's in my shirt, and the, all of the fruits are on top of it. I will get it out as soon as you help me get up. Please help me get up. The old sorcerer disappeared from the top of the, the pit, and Aladdin wasn't sure what happened. And then a few moments later, the sorcerer came back with a big stick in his hand, and he said, If you don't give me that lamp right now, I'm going to beat you senseless. Well, Aladdin looked up, and for the first time, he got a really good look at the old man's eyes, and he realized they were evil and cruel. This cannot be my uncle, he said to himself. I remember enough about my father to know that he was a kind man, not a cruel one, and no uncle would threaten to beat his nephew just because he couldn't get the lamp out of his shirt. No. This cannot be my uncle. This must be an evil sorcerer. And so Aladdin backed up. He remembered what the sorcerer had told him when they had first gotten there. Aladdin had to go down to the pit because the sorcerer knew from his magic that if he went into the caverns, it would be certain death for him. And so Aladdin backed up into the cavern and he said, no, uncle, no. You have to help me up. Throw me a rope or something, and then I can give you the lamp when I get up to the top. Well, the old sorcerer lost his temper at that, and he began to rant and rave and yell and scream at Aladdin, threatening him with all kinds of curses. But there was nothing he could do, for he couldn't climb down into the pit, and he daren't go into the cavern. And so eventually, as night was falling, he decided that if he could not have the lamp, no one could, and Aladdin would just have to die for keeping the lamp away from him. And so quickly, he lit another fire, and he threw some of his powder on it, and with a whoosh, the fire disappeared, the door to the pit closed, and the pit closed over and was gone. Aladdin saw the door begin to close and he cried, oh, Uncle, Uncle, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'll give you the lamp, I'll give you the lamp. But it was too late. The pit had closed over and the evil sorcerer was already on his way back to Africa. Aladdin sat down on the ground in the gold cavern. He was feeling rather sorry for himself and very hungry. He knew that he was going to die down here in this pit. He did not want to die. Oh, mother will be so worried about me, he said, and he began to wring his hands. But when he wrung his hands together, he rubbed his fingers up against the ring that the sorcerer had given him. Suddenly there was a whoosh and a sparkle of light, and Aladdin realized he was no longer alone in the cavern. There, standing in front of him, was a tall man with black skin, as black as the sorcerers had been, and a brightly colored turban on his head. And he bowed to Aladdin, and he said, I am the slave of the lamp. What is your wit, or the slave of the ring? What is your wish, O master of the ring? Aladdin did not know what he was talking about or where this man had come from. And so he just stared at him with his mouth open. And finally, the genie said to him, I am the slave of the ring. By rubbing the ring, you have summoned me forth. I am a genie, and I can grant you a wish. Whatever you wish, O master of the ring, 
it is yours. Well, Aladdin only had one wish right that moment. I wish to be out of this cavern, he said. And with a whoosh and a sparkle of light, Aladdin found himself standing exactly where he had been standing before the pit opened up in the ground and the genie was gone. Well, Aladdin would have thought he had dreamed the whole thing if he could not have reached into his shirt and found one of those sparkling, glittering fruits. And he could feel the lamp down underneath in his shirt too. And so he hurried home and he told his mother the whole story. His mother did not believe him. But he showed her the ring and he showed her the gold coin and he took all of the fruits out of his shirt and he showed her the lamp and the fruits. He said, see mother, see, I'm not lying. I did not make it up. It's true, it really happened. Well, we shall have to be careful and make sure that we do not see that sorcerer ever again. If he ever comes back, Aladdin, do not have anything to do with him and you come tell me right away so that I can stay safe from him too. Now, these fruits, they're very pretty, but I don't think they're worth much. They might bring a potato or two in the market in the morning. And this lamp, I do not know why he wanted the lamp. It's so old and, and rusty and battered. I, it might bring a tomato tomorrow in the market. Tomorrow morning, Aladdin, when it gets light, I will clean up the lamp and wipe down all of these fruits and you will take them all to the market and sell them and see if you can't get us a few potatoes or a piece of rice or, 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 or a tomato or something. All right, mother. So in the morning, Aladdin's mother took the lamp into the kitchen to shine it up before they sold it. She found a clean cleaning rag and she began to polish the lamp with it. But as soon as she rubbed the lamp, there was a whoosh and a bit of smoke, and suddenly there, sitting in the kitchen, was a genie. I am the slave of the lamp. What is your wish, O master of the lamp? Well, Aladdin's mother was so surprised that she shrieked, and then she fainted. Aladdin heard the commotion, and he came running in from the other room, and said, another genie. I am the slave of the lamp, said the genie. What is your wish, O oh master of the lamp? This genie was huge. He was so big that when he was sitting on the floor cross-legged, his head still touched the roof. Aladdin only had one wish right at that moment. He was very hungry. Oh, gee, slave of the lamp, I am hungry. Bring me a fine feast. As you wish, O oh master of the lamp, said the genie, and he disappeared. And a moment later, he reappeared, carrying a great big tray with gold and silver plates on it, lots of food on it. It was a fine feast. He set the tray down in front of Aladdin, and then he bowed, and he disappeared in a little puff of smoke. Well, when Aladdin's mother woke up from her faint, Aladdin showed her the fine food, and he said, Mother, let us eat. His mother was still too upset to eat. She said, Aladdin, this is not right. Allah does not make this kind of thing to happen. It is not right. You must get rid of the lamp and the fr fruits and, and, and the ring and all of it. It will bring us bad luck. Aladdin said, but Mother... I cannot get rid of the ring. It saved my life. And the fruits and the lamp, they all came from the same place. Mother, look at this wonderful food. Please eat some food, Mother. Please. I promise I will take the fruits and the lamp and I will hide them away and you will never have to see them. I promise. I do not think they will bring us bad luck, Mother. I don't. Well... If you promise to keep them hidden, all right, you don't have to get rid of them. And I am rather hungry. And so Aladdin and his mother ate the feast that had been provided. And then when it was done, Aladdin took the beautiful solid gold plates and the solid silver plates, and he took one or two of them to the market, and he sold them to a gold dealer 
who had been very kind to his father when his father had been alive. And so he knew Aladdin would be good to him and give him a good price that for the for the plates. And so Aladdin sold the plates and he got a very good price for them. In fact, he became rather rich. And he took that money that he had and he used it to become a merchant in the marketplace. And he learned every day he went to the marketplace and he learned more and more about becoming a merchant. And he became a very good one. In fact, he became a rather rich merchant, but he never forgot the people who had been poor just like him and the people who had helped him when he was poor. And he made sure that he helped other people with the riches that he got as well. Well, one day, Aladdin was in the market, and suddenly there was a commotion on the edge of the market. The Sultan was returning to his city from a visit to another city. This Sultan controlled the whole city and all of the land about it. But the most precious thing that the Sultan had, even though he was rather a rich Sultan himself, the most precious thing he had was his daughter, the Princess Budir al-Budur, this princess was said to be so beautiful, but no one was exactly sure how beautiful she was, for it was against the law for anyone to look on her, except the sultan and the people who served in his court, his highest, his highest advisors. And so these advisors went before the people into the marketplace, calling out, the princess al-Badir al-Badur is coming through. Everyone must bow their heads so they do not look upon her. Bow your heads, people, so you do not look upon the princess. And everyone bowed their heads and turned away so that they could not see the princess Badir al-Badur, for it was forbidden. But Aladdin was a little curious, and a little bit of mischief crept into him, and so he slipped behind a pillar so that no one else could see him. And as the sultan rode through the square with his daughter in her palanquin behind him, in her little cart behind him, Aladdin peeked around the corner. For you see, he had heard of the princess Badir al-Badur from some of the people that came into his shop. They worked in the palace and they told him that she was a very kind mistress and a very gentle princess and she didn't demand much and she liked to help people. And so he thought she sounded like rather a sweet young woman. And so he wanted to know if her outside matched her inside. And so he stood behind the pillar. And as the sultan rode by, he just peeked around the edge. And he saw the princess Badir al-Badur. And he thought to himself that her outside was even more beautiful than her inside. And that took some doing. The Princess Badir al-Badur was the most beautiful woman Aladdin had ever seen, and he fell instantly in love with her. He had heard she was gentle and kind, and now she was beautiful too? He went home that night, and he was not himself. He was barely eating, and his mother said to him, Aladdin, are you ill? Shall I send for the doctor? No, mother, I am not ill. He said, I am in love. I want to marry the Princess Badir al-Badur. Aladdin, said his mother, that is not possible. It does not matter, my son, that you have gained some wealth, but you are still the son of a poor tailor. There is no way the Sultan would let you marry his daughter. Nevertheless, mother, I am in love with her and I want to marry her. Aladdin, in order to marry the Sultan's daughter, you would have to give him a grand gift, and you do not have anything that would be that wonderful to give him. Oh no, mother, that is not so, he said. And he went into his room and he opened up his hiding place and he brought out all the colorful fruits that he had gathered from the cavern so long ago. And he brought them out and he laid them out on the table. He said, I have these to give to the Sultan, mother. His mother said, Aladdin, they're very pretty, yes, but they're not worthy of a Sultan. Oh, but mother, they are, he said. They are, 
For you see, when I had sold all of the gold plates and all of the silver plates to my friend in the marketplace, he asked me if I had anything else to sell. And I told him that I did, but that I did not think what I had to sell was worth anything. But they were very pretty, and so I brought them to show him, Mother, they're not just glass fruits. These are rubies, the red ones, and the green ones are emeralds, and the white ones are diamonds, and the blue ones, those are sapphires. And mother, they're so big, each one of them, he said, was worth a sultan's ransom. They're quite worthy of the sultan's daughter. Please, mother, please, won't you take them to the sultan and ask him if I can marry his daughter? Please. Well, Aladdin's mother was very frightened of going to the sultan with these stones that supposedly were precious gems. And she was afraid that she would be thrown in the dungeon or have her head chopped off for being so bold as to suggest that her son, who was the son of a poor tailor, would marry the princess, the daughter of the sultan. But Aladdin begged her so much and like all mothers, all she really wanted was for her son to be happy. And so the next morning she got up and she polished the, the stones very carefully. She laid them on a tray and she put a cloth over the top of it. And then she went to the palace. For every day, the Sultan would open the doors of the palace and allow people who had questions for him or wanted to have him help them with a situation they were having to come and he would listen and he would help them if he could. So on this day, the doors opened and Aladdin's mother walked in and they told her she could go in to see the Sultan. And so she came in with the tray in her hands with the big cloth covering it and all of the emirs and all of the lords, and the sultan's vizier, his chief advisor, and the sultan all watched this little woman come in, carrying this tray with a cloth over it, and they all wondered what was in the tray. What was under that cloth? Well, Aladdin's mother came in, and she bowed to the sultan, and she said, and the sultan said, what is it that I can help you with, my, my, my dear madam? And she said, Sultan, please forgive me for what I am about to ask you. Oh, well, ask away, good woman. You will not be punished. Great Sultan, my son Aladdin wishes to marry your daughter, the Princess Budir al Budur. Well, there was silence for a moment, and then there was rather a strange sound. It sounded almost as if someone was snorting a little bit. And Aladdin's mother looked about and she realized the sound was coming from the emperor. And then a moment later, the little snorting turned into a chuckle. And then it turned into a hearty laugh. And the sultan was laughing so hard. He said, your, your son wants to marry my daughter. What on earth could you possibly bring, woman, that would be good enough to earn my daughter's hand? What bride price could you bring? My son sends these beautiful fruits for you, great sultan. Well, the sultan began to laugh even harder when he heard that this boy, Aladdin, wanted to marry his daughter and he was sending fruit as a bride price. But then Aladdin's mother swept the cloth off the tray and the beautiful precious gems on it glittered and glinted and sparkled. The whole room was suddenly filled with all sorts of colorful sparkles for the sun hit the tray just so and it was everywhere. And the Sultan abruptly stopped laughing and he stared at the precious gems on the tray. There is not one thing in my entire storehouse that could compare to just one of those gems, he thought to himself, and he really wanted to have those gems. He called his vizier over and he said, Vizier, I think that this woman has offered a very good bride price for my daughter. What do you think? Oh, said the vizier, perhaps it is a good price, but remember, great sultan, you told me that my son could marry your daughter. 
Oh, this is true, said the Sultan. We did talk about that. I tell you what. I will give you three months, Vizier, to find me something that is as priceless as these gems. If you cannot do that, then at the end of three months, Aladdin will marry my daughter. Oh, great Sultan, there is no way I could possibly find anything in the world as priceless as these gems, said the Vizier. But I can try. Very well, said the Sultan. Woman, you may go home and tell your son, Aladdin, was it? Yes, tell Aladdin that he may marry my daughter in three months' time. Well, Aladdin's mother was quite surprised that she had not been punished and that the Sultan had said yes. And so she got up and she hurried home and she told Aladdin that the Sultan had said he might marry the Princess Badir al Badur in three months' time. Aladdin was overjoyed. He immediately began to make preparations for the wedding, making sure that all of his business affairs were in order, cleaning up the house, buying a few new furnishings, making everything look very nice. In fact, he was so focused on that that he did not go to the market for a while. It did not really matter. He had enough people working in his shop that they could keep the business going without him. But one day he needed some things from the market. And so he went to the market and he found it decorated, with the most beautiful colors and flags. And so many people were there and everyone seemed to be celebrating. And Aladdin called to one of the people nearby and he said, what is going on? What is all of this? And the person said, well, have you not heard? The vizier's son is to marry the sultan's daughter this very day. Oh, no, said Aladdin. The sultan has forgotten his promise to me. And he was so heartbroken that he went straight home. He went straight to his room and he fell on the bed and he began to cry. And in fact, he cried so hard and so long that he cried himself to sleep. And when he woke up, the sky was growing dark and he realized that the vizier's son and the sultan's daughter would have been married by now. And he was so upset. But then he thought of something. For Aladdin was rather a clever boy. And he went to his hiding place and he brought out the lamp. And he rubbed the lamp. And when the, slave, the genie appeared, he said, slave of the lamp. Oh, master of the lamp, what is your desire? Slave of the lamp. I want the princess Budir al Budur, but she has married the vizier's son to this day. So here is what I wish you to do. And so when the vizier's son, who was rather a vain and boastful young man, he got himself all bathed and dressed in his finest nightshirt. He admired himself in the mirror for a little while. Yes, that's good. And he was thinking to himself, how lucky the princess was to have married such a handsome man as he was. And then he went to the princess's room to go to sleep. But as soon as he stepped foot in the room, something grabbed him by the back of the neck. The princess watched in astonishment from where she was sitting on the bed as the vizier's son was pushed across the room and then his head was stuffed into a jar on the floor. He tried to pull it off, but it was stuck right where his ears were and he couldn't get it off over his ears. And so he was crying out from inside the jar, help, help, get this off of me. But it just echoed around him in the jar and it was very faint. And outside the jar, it sounded like, help, help, help this off of me. People couldn't really hear him very well. And just as the vizier's son was thinking that he would go back to the door and get one of the guards to help him, suddenly the invisible power stuck his feet to the floor and he couldn't move. All he could do was like, oh, help, help, oh, somebody help me. And the princess was calling out to him, turn, turn to the side. Perhaps if you put your head down, it will fall off. And she was giving all kinds of suggestions and she tried to get up and help pull it off of him. And it wasn't working. And he spent all night there struggling to get that jar off of his head. 
and trying to move his feet so that he could sit down or something. And eventually, he just yelped himself hoarse and his legs got sore. And the princess ended up sitting on the bed crying for he had started yelling at her and insulting her when he couldn't get the bit jar off his head. As soon as the sun rose above the horizon, suddenly, magically, his feet were no longer stuck to the floor and the jar popped right off of his head. He was so upset and so angry that he yelled at the princess and he stormed off to his own room and he slept for half the day. Well, that next night, the same thing happened. And then the night after that, the vizier's son spent all night glued to the floor with a jar stuck on his head for a week. Now the princess, she was rather frightened by all of this for it was some kind of strong magic, she was sure. But she didn't want to tell her father about it for it was very strange and frightening. And But she grew sadder and sadder as the week went on. And eventually the Sultan decided that perhaps this marriage had not been such a good idea and he had it canceled. Aladdin was so happy when he heard that the marriage to the vizier's son had been canceled. And so he jumped up and down and then he went and he dressed himself in his finest clothes. And he went to the palace and he said he was there to see the Sultan. And they took him before the Sultan and he said, Sultan, I am Aladdin and it has been three months and you promised that at the end of three months, I could marry the Princess Badir al Badur. Oh, that's right, I did promise that, said the Sultan. Well, you know, after the last marriage, I'm not going to be quite so foolish again. The princess must give her consent this time. And so they summoned the princess. Now, the Princess Badir al Badur had also heard of the kind merchant Aladdin from the servants who had worked, who had gone to his shop to buy things. And so when they told her that the kind merchant had come to visit and wanted to marry her, she wanted to see him very much indeed, for she wanted to see if his outside was as beautiful as his inside. And when she came into the throne room, she was very happy to see that his outside was quite as beautiful as his inside. He was quite the most handsome man she had ever seen. And she said to her father, oh, father, he will be a very handsome prince to be with. And I have heard that he is very kind as well. I would gladly marry Aladdin. Good, said the sultan. Ah, uh, you will marry him tomorrow. Tomorrow, said Aladdin. Oh, that is perfect. It gives me just enough time to build a palace. Build a palace? You are going to build a palace in just one day, said the sultan. Oh, yes, said Aladdin. And, great sultan, I shall build it just opposite your gates so that you can come and visit your daughter whenever you like. And so then Aladdin turned from the palace and he hurried home. And he brought out the lamp and he rubbed the lamp. And when the genie arrived, he said, oh, master of the lamp, what is your desire? Genie, I want a beautiful palace, just right for the princess, just opposite the sultan's gate, and I need it by tomorrow morning. As you wish, master, said the slave of the lamp, and he disappeared in a puff of smoke. The next morning, very early, the sultan got up and he was walking in his gardens when he suddenly realized he could see towers and turrets over there where he had not seen them before. And when he went to the gate and he looked out, he saw that there was a grand palace. The tops of the towers were covered with gold and the doors of the palace were studded with gems. Well, my daughter, come quickly, he called. Aladdin has said what he's, he's done what he said. Come, let us go and see the palace. And so they went to see the palace, the most beautiful palace they've ever seen. And so richly and beautifully furnished, the genie had thought of everything. And so the sultan declared that Aladdin and the princess Budir al-Budur would be married that evening. Well, Aladdin 
was tempted to go out on a hunt with some of the other young men of the court. And so they all gathered and they got on their horses and they were getting ready to ride off. Now the thing is, Everything's looking very rosy for Aladdin and the princess, isn't it? But there's a black cloud on the horizon, for you see, the evil sorcerer had found out from his magic that Aladdin had not died down that pit, and he was not happy. And so he had set off from his home in Africa to come back to China so that he could find Aladdin and get that lamp for himself. For he was sure that Aladdin had the lamp. And he just so happened to arrive in the city on the day of the wedding. Now Aladdin was climbing on the horse and all of the men were so happy and the hounds were yapping and off they rode. Just as the evil sorcerer came up under the walls of the, the palace. Now he had gone to the village to the, the marketplace, and he had bought a whole bunch of brand new lamps, and he hung them round his neck on a rope, and he walked along under the windows of the palace, calling out, new lamps for old lamps, new lamps for old lamps, exchange your new, your old lamp for a new one. Now, Aladdin had brought all of his things to the palace that morning, but he had not yet had time to put them all away. And one of the things that the princess had noticed in his possessions was a very old and battered lamp. For Aladdin had not taken the time to hide it before he had gone out on his hunt. And the princess thought how wonderful it would be for her husband if she were able to give him a new lamp in place of this old and battered one when he came back from his hunt. And how pleased Aladdin would be. And so she took the lamp with her and she went out to the old man and she called out to him and she said, I have an old lamp here. Would you trade it for one of your new lamps? And she gave the lamp to one of her maidservants to take to the old man. And the old man took the lamp and he looked at it. And then he gave a great shriek of delight and he threw all of the old new lamps down on the ground and he ran off with the old lamp. As soon as the evil sorcerer got outside of the town, he rubbed the lamp and the genie appeared and said, I am the slave of the lamp. What is your wish, O oh master of the lamp? Slave of the lamp, said the genie, said the sorcerer. Take Aladdin's palace and his princess and transport it to my house in Africa. Oh, and take me too. As you wish, O oh master of the lamp. And the genie disappeared in a poof of smoke. Now all of the people that had been coming to the city to see the marriage, the wedding between Aladdin and the princess Budir al-Budur, were crowding into the city. And suddenly they noticed a great black cloud on the horizon. And it came into the city and the people shrieked and tried to get out of the way, but it spread out until nobody could see anything and anywhere in the whole city. And then when the black cloud began to lift and rise up into the sky and sail off towards the horizon, suddenly people realized something was very wrong. For Aladdin's palace was gone. Just gone. Look, cried one of the people. And when they looked at the black cloud on the horizon, they could see the palace glittering on the top of the cloud as it sailed away. The Sultan when he found out what had happened, was furious. Where is my daughter? Who has stolen my daughter? Was this Aladdin's plan all along? And he was so furious that he sent his guards out to find Aladdin on his hunt and bring him back under arrest. When Aladdin was brought back, he was surprised to see that his palace was gone, and so was his princess. And the emperor threatened to cut off his head. And he said, no, no, please, Sultan, please, please. I beg you, give me one day to go and find my princess and my palace. I will bring them back, I promise you. Very well, said the sultan, for he had rather started to like this young man. Very well, I give you one last chance. Go, bring back your palace and my daughter, and I will not kill you. Go. And so Aladdin ran out of the city as far away as he could get from other people, and then he rubbed his ring. And the genie appeared and he said, 
What do you wish, O master of the ring? What happened to my princess? he asked. And the, the genie of the ring told him all that had happened. He said, bring back my palace and my princess right now. I am sorry, O oh master, said the slave of the ring, but I cannot. I do not have the power to contradict an order given by the master of the lamp. Oh dear, thought Aladdin, what am I going to do now? But he thought quickly, and then he said, slave of the ring, can you take me to my palace? I can do that, O oh master. Then do so. And suddenly, poof, with a little bit of a sparkle, Aladdin found himself standing in the middle of a dry, barren place in the middle of Africa. And there was his palace in front of him. He could hear someone sobbing inside the palace. And he knew it was his princess. He called out to her. And she came out on the balcony. She says, oh, Aladdin, can you forgive me? I tried to trade your lamp. And, and now look at what has happened. Aladdin ran into the palace and he... He hugged the princess close and he said, where is the old sorcerer and where is the lamp? Oh, he wears it about his neck. He will not let it out of his sight, she said. He has gone out, but he will be back soon, I think. Very well, I know what to do, said Aladdin. And he rubbed the ring and he said, oh, slave of the ring, bring me a strong sleeping potion. Well, when the old sorcerer returned, he was very surprised to find and pleased to find that the princess was no longer crying. Ah, have you come to like your new home then? Oh, I, I think it is quite different and rather lovely, she said, but it is so very hot here. You must be thirsty. Let us have a cool drink. And she gave him a large silver goblet full of wine. And he was so thirsty that he gulped the whole thing down. It was not long before the sleeping potion started to take effect. And his eyes became so very heavy. And, oh, I'm so very sleepy. Why am I so tired? His eyes got heavier and heavier and he had to lay his head on the table. And just as his eyes closed, he saw Aladdin coming out from behind the curtain. And he knew what had happened. But it was too late, for the sleeping potion had taken effect, and only the slave of the ring knew how strong the sleeping potion was. The evil sorcerer would sleep for 50 years. Aladdin took the lamp back and he said, now I am master of the lamp. And he ordered the servants that were in the palace to take the evil sorcerer out and leave him out in the desert. And then they all came back and he rubbed the lamp and the, and the slave of the lamp came out and said, Oh, master of the lamp, what is your wish? Transport me and the palace and the princess and all of our people back to China where we belong. As you wish, said the master, said the slave of the lamp. And with a puff of smoke, he disappeared. And as the sultan was walking in his garden that afternoon, he saw a dark cloud appear on the horizon and he thought it was rather odd. And then as it got closer, he saw glittering something on the top of it. And it got even closer and he saw that it was Aladdin's palace. And he became so happy. The palace came, the cloud came, and it settled on the city. And then when the cloud lifted, there was Aladdin's palace just across the street from the sultan's gates and waving from the top window were Aladdin and the princess Budir al Badur. The sultan was so overjoyed that he ordered the wedding to happen immediately. And so Aladdin and the princess Budir al Badur were married and they were very happy together and very kind to everyone around them. And when the sultan died, Aladdin became sultan in his place. And that is the story of how a poor tailor's son married the princess, and became a sultan. And that is the story of Aladdin and the Wonderful Lamp. I hope you enjoyed it. It came from the 1001 Nights or the Arabian Nights. I hope you enjoyed our story today, and I hope you'll tune in again 
Check out our YouTube channel, Milledgeville Public Library, Illinois, to find more stories and to see more stories as we upload them in future weeks. Have a great day, everybody. Bye.